we are going to focus on two tremendous characters, actually. It's the, it's the first time in a long while that I have, have sort of laughed my way through most of the prep work. And most of that comes from Mick McCarthy because some of his quotes are brilliant. And we may well have to put, um, you know, a, a, an adult warning on this podcast if we decide to quote some of them, because he is very straight to the point. But what you see is what you get with Mick. And that is the great thing about him, isn't he? It's He's so genuine. He's so authentic. And he also is so straight down the line with post-match interviews as well. Yeah, authenticity is the key word where Mick McCarthy is concerned. You know, it's a flow state for him to just say what he thinks and what he really feels. And we're not talking about logic here necessarily. We're talking about what he feels and, you know, his moral compass, I guess, what it tells him. And, you know, we'll just go straight in with a, a swear word straight away because he is no bullshit. You see the word bullshit on headlines that, you know, it, it, when you're reading these articles, it's you can't not kind of use the language that Mick McCarthy uses sometimes because it sums him up perfectly. And, you know, I think he, he possibly thinks that a lot of this is to do with his upbringing and the fact he was brought up in Barnsley and it's kind of a no, nonsense part of the world. But I think it's his personality as well. I think it's just, you know, I mean, his background has shaped him, but he clearly cares a lot about people being able to just be themselves, authentically themselves. And sometimes we talk about football managers and that's individual expression on the pitch and that's, you know, showing your talent. This is this is about being congruent with yourself as far as Mick McCarthy is concerned. As long as you're in a moral, you're being true to yourself and what you want to be doing and how you want to be feeling about certain things, then, you know, that that that's his, his go-to, basically. This is just something that comes natural to him. Yeah, and, um, you know, you say he just credit his upbringing, but over the years, you know, he's clocked up a thousand games now. Um, so those experiences will have shaped him. And he talks extensively about his time working with Jack Charlton and, and how that shaped both his playing and his managerial career. And as soon as you've got a, a swear word out of the way, Mike, here's one for you. Uh, this is the quote that he, he said he, he remembers most about Jack Charlton and the inspiration for his managerial career. He says, make sure you're all inside the tent pissing out. Get rid of any fellow who's outside the tent pissing in. So that sort of tells you that he wants everyone to buy in and anyone who doesn't get it, anyone who doesn't, fully involve themselves or is, is, is sort of determined to work against what McCarthy wants will be straight out. So yeah, no messing around. Mick McCarthy wants every player to really buy in. And you can see that actually at various points during his managerial career, can't you? Where that, that Wolves team where every player was in, every player was doing what he asked. And it's lovely to see when it, when it all works out. Yeah. And this is very much in, uh, you know, this is a memory he's recalled and something he's consciously taken on board. This isn't necessarily a natural part of his personality this is just a valuable piece of experience that he's picked up from someone else and applied throughout his career it's very much in the same way of say a Gareth Ainsworth at Wickham in that there's a real togetherness there but it's from allowing individuals to be authentically themselves and comfortable within their own skin within the dressing room and that in itself brings to brings togetherness with it as a, as a byproduct almost so it's not a case of it's not a case of he creates this big group dynamic of this is what we stand for, this is what we're all about. It's like, no, you're all individually, authentically yourselves, but this is what we're trying to achieve. And as long as you all feel comfortable and you all tell it as it is and you're all you're all true to yourselves and allow me to be true to myself and say what I want to say and, and, and that we're all, you know, that this is sometimes the truth can be raw, as he says in one quote, you know, there's no point dressing it up for certain people. You need to tell it as it is, but as long as we get to that place where everybody's comfortable with that, then the togetherness, sort of the bonding comes together afterwards because, you know, we just need to understand, right, we're, all our objectives are aligned, even though we're individuals. And you sort of feel when you listen and, and see Mick McCarthy that you sort of think, well, I will not want to get in an argument with him, but actually, from what it seems, he quite likes an argument. He like quite likes players to to have a go. He he did it himself. He talked about how you know he had a disagreement with Jack Charlton on the sidelines, and you know at the end of it they just shook hands and said, "Well, you know, we'll just agree to disagree." And it seems that he quite likes his players to you know if, if he has a go at them, he sort of wants them to have a go back as well. 
Yeah, I think he thinks it's healthy to get things off your chest, basically, because I think it. I think this is kind of emotion that builds up inside. If you get frustrated with something and you don't, you don't let it out, and you just, you just keep it bottled up inside, then I, I think it affects your performance. And and, it, and he's very conscious of mind body aspects. It, it's everything he does is geared towards people, not environment. So he's always aware of players' energy levels, of where players might be in their own mental space. He tries to put himself in other players' shoes and things like that. So he's very conscious of these things. And I think one of the big things is, is if a player can release emotions that they don't want and things like that and can vent and get things off the chest, then, it, then I think he sees that as entirely healthy. And it's very much in keeping with his own personality and the way he goes about things himself. And players really seem to enjoy working with him as well. You know, I think it might take a few weeks sometimes for them to get on board with his gruff Yorkshire approach. And I mean, let's face it, the players at Applewell um, probably wondered what had hit him when he came into the dressing room because some players who were south of the Thames probably not, don't understand what he's what he's talking about. But the players do all seem to really enjoy having Mick around. And I think he, he also brings that sprinkling of humour to the everyday training, that you know, that, which I guess can get quite mundane for some players, but having Mick around must help lift those spirits. Yeah, he's, uh, he's he can be very self-deprecating. He's just good value to have around day to day. He's he is very in the moment. You know, he doesn't he, he doesn't get ahead of himself or or you know have big ideas of the way things should be go. He just takes on board things as they present themselves. He meets challenges head on and doesn't you know he's he's not determined for things to go down a certain path. Um, but you know he's got all these. He's got all these uh, witty one-liners and things like that that he pulls out. He collects these turns of phrase because he's capable of he's capable of in the moment to just you know lighten the mood. If there's any tension, he, he's perfectly capable with just you know at the drop of a hat by saying something or making an observation, just completely lightening the mood and taking the weight off everybody's shoulders. And I think you know this comes from. The, you know, even the swearing, you, you know, it, it, it's about messaging. It's about how you get your message across. The swearing's for impact. If if it makes people take notice of what you're saying because you say it in a funny way, you shock people, there's a bit of shock value in the words that you're using and stuff like that, and you've got these funny turns of phrase, then it has an impact. And he's all about trying to make that impact, get the message across, make sure that people understand what it is I'm trying to say. So don't just, you know, don't, don't, tiptoe around a subject, don't get to the point. Get to the point and get to the point in a way that people are going to remember what you've got to say. Yeah, I saw an interview with, um, it was a journalist who used to work in Ireland when Mick was in charge of the national team there. And he was back for his second spell at the time and he said, well, we may have had our run-ins in the past and I may still be a bit scared of Mick, but Mick is good value. And when we've had other managers who are so afraid of giving you any information and will do everything to, to kind of, just be reserved and and not give you anything that you might latch on to. Having Mick there was a breath of fresh air because there was always something quotable. He always had something to say, even after abysmal performances. He was he was always willing to chat. And I guess, yeah, I, I guess that relationship uh, with the media and he knows the importance as well, doesn't he? Of, of, of I guess, PR as well. He, you know, he wants to he wants to get the message out there, like you say, and journalists and reporters and anyone clearly enjoy having Mick to uh, write about. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, you know, it comes back to authenticity again, you know, it comes back to the fact that, you know, he, he's never going to compromise on this. Like, we, you, you know, he's very conscious of the PR side and he, he, he wants to get his message across, but he's not going to compromise his authenticity on what he really believes in and things like that. So you go back to Ipswich, for example, he, he, he caused a lot of ripples at Ipswich and, and upset the fan base on, on numerous occasions with things that he said. But that's the authenticity comes first, but also the understanding that the messaging is important. Now, within the dressing room, you can upset people outside of the dressing room, but if it's true and congruent to what's being thought of and, and what's... And he's very protective of his players in this way as well. I think he takes a lot on his own shoulders, takes pressure off players... By making himself the villain, you know, if things aren't going well, he comes out and makes himself the villain and the players feel protected and it kind of doesn't matter what's going on outside of the dressing room, you know. And But but yeah, he's very he's very aware. Again, we come back to this is impact on people, not environment. You know, the the the, the way that you present your messaging, it's it, it, he's trying to influence people with the things that he says. He's not trying to, he's not just banging the same drum for the same objective, the same goals that are to do with, you know, what's best for the overall collective or anything like that. 
You talk about the protection of his players. He's also very loyal as well, you know, with in terms of the coaches and the assistants that he uses. Terry Connor pretty much goes everywhere with him. You know, he he likes having these familiar faces around and and, and loyalty seems like a, a really important thing to Mick McCarthy. Yeah, it's a value. It's an emotional value. And, you know, this is this is what it's all about. You know, this authenticity is all about his own set of personal values and loyalty and trust and things like that are obviously very high up there. The 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 importance of being having relationships with people that you can be very honest with each other. And, and, and sometimes authenticity means, you know, sharing your darkest thoughts sometimes, sharing when you don't like someone and why you don't like them and things like that. And, it, it you know... Over the years, this doesn't work with everybody. I mean, you can go back to Saipan and what happened with Roy Keane. He gave Roy Keane a platform to express exactly how he felt about what was going wrong. Didn't realise that, you know, the way Roy Keane expresses himself in those kind of situations, he just added fuel to a fire that was became irreparable after that. You know, you just can't go back. Once Roy Keane's got his two penneth to say, gets to say it in the way he wants to say it and just, you know, no holds bad, then there was no turning back. So... You know, this this is it's a process of trial and error over the years. You you only get to find out through experience over time. Okay, these guys understand me for who I am. I can trust them completely. I want them by my side every step of the way. You know, and that's why he's never been in contact with Roy Keane ever again since what happened in Japan. Because okay, we found out that you know my style of management and my giving you the floor to be as authentic as you want and say whatever you want and get it off your chest. You know, that it, it didn't work in that instance. So, you know, it's this comes from experience. And when you get to a thousand games, you know, you, you're in that position where you pretty much know, you know, the people that you can trust. And, you know, you, you've, you've kind of got a lot of answers for these kinds of, you know, situations. Do you think that Mick McCarthy suffers from a bit of misconception when it comes to his football as well? You know, he often gets labelled as a dinosaur. Um, and I don't know whether that is just purely by the fact he's clocked up a thousand games. You know, and when he comes into clubs that some fans are a bit like, oh, another step on the, the managerial merry-go-round for Mick McCarthy. But, you know, that Neil Harris team was really struggling before he left. And Mick McCarthy came in and he took up a, a bunch of players whose confidence was low. And he didn't just tighten them up. He got them scoring as well. You know, he unleashed the attacking potential in a lot of players. And... That's not that's not a manager, a prehistoric manager who comes in and just shores things up. And you know he is not doing what Tony Pulis does. This is you know Mick. Do you think he deserves more credit than what he gets when it comes to style of play? I do think he's adaptable, um, and I think what you get out of a Mick McCarthy team is relative to the budget and relative to the the, the quality that you've got at your disposal. Ultimately, I think there's a real competitive drive behind him. And he just wants to strike upon whatever it is that gets results, what works and what is the best way to play today. He doesn't, you know, he's not a philosophy man. He doesn't get too far ahead of himself thinking, I want to play a certain way or anything like that. He's just thinking about the next game and what's going to work. What's going to really drive these players? What's going to motivate them and really want to, you know, really dig deep and give the very best of themselves? That's his focus. Now, he's kind of, over the years, become a manager that, punches above his weight on lower budgets and you know that that's 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 kind of just what what he's become I I just think he's there's there's a pragmatic streak when it comes to results that comes from a competitive edge but there's also an adaptability if something's not work he will change it if something works he will stick with it and you know it sometimes the quickest and easiest answers can be simple football but ultimately it's what you do out of possession is that there's certain non-negotiables there that, you know, hard work and industry from players and, and that drive is, you know, it's got to be there as a first and foremost. So when you see that come into place first, there's a tendency to think that there's nothing else beyond that, you know, because, well, this is working. You don't throw out what's broken. You know, we're, we're clearly good without the ball. We do these things off the ball, out of possession and stuff like that. That side of the game is right. So in trying to become more expressive or do things in different ways, you don't throw that out first. So it's kind of always front and centre of a Mick McCarthy team is that they've got all these sort of qualities instilled in them that aren't, you know, that can often be portrayed as ugly qualities. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a bit unfair because I think, I think you know, he, he, he basically just gets teams competing. Uh, but with you, when you're with lower budget teams or you're not necessarily with 
the the most talented group of players in a division, then by by definition, you're not going to be the most exciting team in the division to watch and the most pleasing on the eye. Yeah, he had Ipswich in mid-table in the Championship. And, you know, since he left, they've, they've been relegated into League One and, and obviously we'll be hoping to get up this season under Paul Cook, but uh, wouldn't couldn't manage it under Paul Lambert either. So, um, yeah, he had them competing in mid-table. It may not have been enjoyable, but as you say, Mick was just using the tools that he had. And some interesting quotes from Kevin Foley uh, from his time at Wolves working under Mick. And I guess this plays into what you say about making sure you do the industry and the hard work first and then everything else comes. Kevin Foley, first of all, talked about on his Wolves debut when Mick was manager, he said that he thought he'd had a really good, a really good performance. Show. He was really pleased. He came off really happy with his performance. And Mick McCarthy took him to one side and said, if you, you let that Bradford winger past you, if you do that one more time, you're out of the team. You're not, you're not back in. And that sort of rang alarm bells with, with Foley. He sort of said, well, I knew that I had to do the basics first before I got carried away with anything else further up the field. And from that point onwards, he just concentrated on exactly what the manager wanted him to do each and every week. And then he also goes on to say that Mick made him sit down and watch a video of a free kick being taken against them. And a player in the wall jumped up and let the ball go underneath him. And um, it resulted in a, in a goal. He said, if you ever do that in my team, if you ever shirk your responsibility in a wall, then you're out. You're straight out. You're not. You're not coming back in. So, like you say, it's the it's the no compromises that that Mick asks for. You know, if you've got a player like Foley who's able to take that on board and say, right, okay, I know I must never do that again, or that's what I need to do, then you can see how those results come quite quickly, can't you? Yeah, and and it's interesting that the, the examples you use there and the fact that you used to fit. You know, a lot of this is to do with body language and it's to do with uh, players. You know. Again, it's about individuals and about about the mind body aspects, what you're doing and not doing. It's not about systems. It's not about bigger picture thinking or anything like that. It's it's dealing with players on an individual basis and saying, you know, like pointing out, you know, how players act in a wall and stuff like that. It's, it's picking up on cues, and I think that's what he does. He said this comes pat this comes kind of hand in hand with the 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 being in the moment thing. Is that Mick McCarthy's strength? is this adaptability, is to be, stand on this touchline and just see things he doesn't like in little cues of body language, of player behaviour. And I think once players understand that if your body language drops and gives off bad signals for a second, he's going to be on you, you're kind of on it all the time then. And I think that's that, that's the major lesson that comes through that, that Kevin Foley speaks about and that every player will be in the same boat. They'll be knowing that if their if their standards drop for a second, if the shoulders drop, if they're not picking up a man, they're not they're not paying attention, they're not being alert, McCarthy's going to be all over them. And, and that's probably the biggest fear. So that's that that that's what leads to this underlying how a team performs so consistently out of possession and does that dirty side of the game so well. You know, the, the, this is what it comes from. It comes from me, Mick McCaffrey being in the moment, being really aware of these body language cues and jumping in the very slightest indication that a, a, a player is not just, you know, carrying out their responsibility in any given moment. Yeah, absolutely. And describe yourself as old school regularly. It's interesting, isn't it? You talk about the self-deprecation. Well, Mick won't embrace social media. In fact, he, I can go, go as far as saying he despises social media. Um, I'm pretty sure he doesn't listen to podcasts, Mike. I'm pretty sure he's not a regular Fox Punter Manager profiler, profiling listener, but you never know. Um, but it's interesting because not a lot of managers would happily describe themselves as old school, would they? Because I guess that that's the perception that, that the media would take. And I guess that is everything summed up with Mick. He just doesn't care. He's happy to call himself old school, to be self-depreciating in that manner. And doesn't care about what everyone thinks. Yeah, totally. He, yeah, he's just, again, literally everything with McCarthy comes back to authenticity. He's got a very, very clear idea of what his own identity is. And he lives that identity out day by day. And, you know, it's old school. But it's also not just old school in the sense of conformity. You know, he, he's not um, he's not living, you know, the values of people gone by and the way things used to be done. He's not harking back to the past. He just, he's just, everything is underpinned by his his upbringing in Barnsley, his, his you know, the fact that he was a centre-half, the fact that he cleaned boots, all of those kinds of things. He sees a lot of values that he identifies with as good values in those old school ways, but 
he's he's he's, he's also a manager he's also a manager that's quite prepared to challenge authority and will speak up against you know people in the very highest power and you, you go back to that occasion when he changed 10 players at Wolves for example and and, and completely rotated his team and and got absolute pelters from the media from the Premier League even had a go at him his own club wouldn't back him you know and it was coming from all angles and he stood up to it all and just kind of took on everybody and was you know a, a sweary one liner best in uh, you know at that time and you know it's so it's not old school in the sense that you know everything should be done a certain way and we should respect the values of the past and people you know these youngsters should have more respect he still sees himself as 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 a player as I saw mentioned in one feature you know he's still kind of in his 60s identifies as one of the lads on the training ground so he's he's all for getting with young people it's not old school in that sense it's just old school values because they really resonate with his authenticity of what's important to be an upstanding person and, you know, that that moral compass. Yeah, and we're not likely to see him on social media anytime soon, although he does make a very good meme and apparently he does know about them as well. Um, so he is aware. Um, so finally, Mike, a uh, really good run, obviously, when he came in in Wales and Cardiff almost at one point looked as though they were going to snatch a playoff spot. Bit of a wobble after that, but then seemed to get back on track towards the end of the campaign. What do you think... He is capable of at Cardiff. You know, he's 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 had that bounce. He's now got to, I guess, improve the squad this summer. There'll be low knees going going out and, and I'm sure some more coming back in. But do you think Cardiff are a playoff bound under Big Mick? Uh, I think Cardiff should be looking for a top six finish. I think they should have been looking for a top six finish last season, but the damage was done towards the end of Neil Harris's reign. Um, they did finish top six the season before. So I think that's par for them. I think it is to be in that top six, not necessarily automatics. I think that would be punching, uh, which McCarthy is more than capable. But I think also last season there was, um, you know, it's interesting we're doing this podcast now on the on the opening weekend of Euro 2020 because Mick McCarthy could well have been involved in that with Republic of Ireland and Wales was a big distraction, I think, for McCarthy towards the back end of the season. They went into the March international break motoring and looking like a team that would get on course for a top six finish. They'd just beaten Swansea away, uh, you know, in, in the South Wales derby. Then everyone went away for international duty. Now, Mick McCarthy, knowing this from experience as a former international manager, said, sometimes you go away, there's a big tournament on the horizon and you kind of just lose the messaging. You know, the players come back. They've been, they, they might even be tired from what they've been doing with their international teams. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on in that two-week break that then you come back and you, you're kind of resetting from scratch. And I think that really undermined Cardiff this season. And I think it kind of derailed any chances of them finishing in the top six. 